Hi, in today's lecture, we're going to revisit uh, the idea of using topological methods to analyze time series data. Uh, in particular, we're going to look through some of the theory behind swipers. Uh, and in doing so, we're going to cover one of the most important ideas um, in the application of persistent homology to data analysis, and that is the idea of stability. Um, throughout the lecture, there will be four prompts uh, to answer uh, four different questions. Uh, please uh, stop and take a minute to think about the questions um, and answer them as best as you can. Let's get started. So last time um, we talked about this idea of swipers, uh, which stands for sliding windows and one persistent scoring. Uh, the idea was that uh, you can start with a time series, let's say F, and then from F, uh, you construct something called uh, the sliding window of F, which is this vector valued function, which uh, for each time t uh, constructs the vector given by f of t, f of t plus tau, f of t plus 2 tau, and all the way up to f of t plus d tau. Here, d and tau are two parameters uh, of the construction. And by applying the sliding window to uh, several values of t, we obtain uh, the sliding window point cloud. And then uh, the main idea we explored was uh, using the persistence diagrams of the sliding window point cloud uh, to get features uh, about the time series. So in particular, if you have something that is periodic, then you're gonna see um, a very persistent point here in the persistence diagram in dimension one um, and here, uh, the notation again means that I'm computing uh, the first persistence diagram of the sliding window point cloud using the RIPS complexes to turn this point cloud into a sequence of complexes in which I can uh, compute persistence diagrams. Um, and the sort of the other idea we saw is that one can use uh, maximum persistence, for example, the distance uh, from the point that is farthest away from the diagonal to the diagonal uh, to measure recurrence in the, in the time series. Um, so given this pipeline, a natural question that emerges is how does one uh, choose the parameters D and tau uh, for the construction that we just outlined? Um, so that's what I wanna do today. Uh, I want to explain the theory uh, of how to understand uh, this construction, where again, we're computing the persistence diagrams of the sliding window point cloud uh, we're using the RIPS complexes, and we're also computing persistence over some field of coefficients. Um, in order to illustrate the uh, approach we're gonna take, um, I would like to start with a simple example. Um, so let's take uh, the, 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 the following function. So the function is gonna be um, f of t equals to sine of l times t, where l is just a natural number, you know, like two, three, four, or five. Uh, what are we going to do next? Uh, we're going to compute the sliding window of F. Um, and as we defined it before, the sliding window of F is uh, applying the function <clears throat> at T, at T plus tau, and all the way up to T plus D times tau. Um, now, um, if you look at the function sine, then we can use uh, the trigonometric identities for the sine of T the sum of two angles. So if we do that on each coordinate separately, then we can rewrite this vector as the following expression, uh, where here I have cosine of LT times this vector of sines plus sine of LT times this vector of cosines. So for example, if you look at the first coordinate, you'll see that it, this is cosine times zero plus sine times one, and that recovers the first entry. The second entry would be cosine LT sine L tau, and then plus sine LT times cosine L tau, which would recover the uh, second entry using trigonometric identities. Um, the thing to notice now is that here the variable is T. In other words, uh, this vector of sines and also this vector of cosines are constant. In other words, they are not changing as I vary T. So uh, let's go ahead and just call them uh, u and v, right? So this vector of sines, I'm gonna call it u, and this vector of cosines, I'm gonna call it v. 
uh, to indicate again that these are constant vectors once we fix the parameters d and tau. The thing to realize is that this in fact parametrizes an ellipse, right? Uh, as t changes, uh, we're going around using cosine of lt plus sine of ltv. Uh, we're going around l times around at least for t between zero and two pi um, for u and v being the vectors that span the ellipse. Uh, so here's a, a pictorial uh, description of what just happened. The sliding window of sine of lt can be written as cosine of lt times u uh, plus sine of lt times v, where u and v are constant vectors. Um, so here's the picture. Um, so the one thing to remember is that um, persistence, or at least persistence, persistent homology in dimension one, when using the Ribs complex, um, measures sort of how big the, the holes are in the uh, data we are collecting, correct? So if we wanted to uh, increase the persistence of uh, the sliding window point cloud right here, then we would like this ellipse to be as circular as possible, right? Because sort of the more squashed it is, the smaller the persistence of the hole is going to be. So uh, one thing one can do to increase sort of the circularity of these uh, ellipse is making u and v as orthogonal as possible and having the same length. Uh, and we do that by changing the parameters d and tau. Uh, in other words, uh, the sliding window uh, point cloud is going to be as round as possible when we choose d and tau so that u and v have the same length and they are perpendicular to each other. In other words, their inner product is zero. Um, another way to write this condition of roundness is as follows. Um, let's look at the uh, inner product right here. So we can write it as uh, just u uh, inner product with v. And I'm going to add these uh, extra expressions. So I'm going to multiply by 4, and I'm going to square it. Uh, this seems a little suspicious, but in a moment, it'll be clear why I'm doing this. Um, and then we're going to take this expression right here, and I'm going to square the norm of u. I'm going to square the norm of v. I'm going to take that difference, and I'm going to square that. So using trigonometric identities, one can show that this expression is in fact equal to this uh, quotient right here. So if we want this quantity to be zero, in other words, for the length of u to be equal to the length of v, that is exactly the same thing as asking for v square right here to be zero, right? Because both of these terms are uh, sort of equal if and only if their squares are equal. Um, and then asking for the inner product to be zero is exactly the same thing as asking the square to be zero and even multiplied by four. So asking both for these to be zero and for these to be zero is the same thing as asking for this entire expression to be zero. Why? Because this term right here is non-negative. This term right here is non-negative. So if this is zero, it's because these has to be zero and these has to be zero, uh, which is exactly what we want. Um, the reason why I wrote it in this sort of mysterious fashion is because right away, this condition of the quotient being equal to zero tells you how uh, L, D, and tau have to be related, knowing at what places sine of theta is equal to zero. So the conclusion from here is that if we want these two terms to be zero, uh, that's the same as asking this quotient to be zero, which happens if and only if this uh, term right here is uh, congruent to zero modulo pi. Uh, if it is uh, an integer multiple of pi, right? Those are the zeros of, of sine. So uh, this happens in particular when uh, we choose the multiple to be two pi, right? Uh, so this is one instance, one choice of parameters uh, for d and tau where the sliding window point cloud will be as, will be as round as possible. Um, I'm going to change this expression just a little bit. I'm going to multiply on both sides by d, um, and I'm going to divide on both sides 
by L times D plus one. Uh, so if I do that, then I have an expression of this form. Uh, and the reason why I wrote it in this fashion is because it's telling you that D times tau has to be equal to this quotient uh, times two pi over L. Um, and, and, and here's why this is useful. Um, so if one remembers the construction of the sliding window, um, then you will realize that D times tau is actually the size of the window, the window size. And if you look at the function sine of LT, you will realize that two pi over L is in fact the size of the period, the period length of this function. So what these uh, computation is telling you is that the sliding window point cloud will be as round as possible, at least for this function, um, when the window size is very close to being equal to the period length. Uh, and then this fraction here is telling you how close we're getting. So we've seen that studying the sliding window point clouds of functions like sine of theta is actually not that hard. Um, and hopefully by answering question number one, you will see that taking sums of sines and cosines actually, uh, it's, actual, it's also not that hard. So um, one avenue that, op that opens up to try to understand um, sliding window point clouds of more general functions is connected to the DL Fourier series. Uh, so let me go ahead and give you a very, very, very terse introduction to the DL Fourier series, uh, but I recommend uh, you dig deeper if you want to learn more about the topic. Um, so what is uh, the Fourier series theorem about? So here's the idea. Suppose that you have a function f from zero to two pi, uh, with values in the real numbers. And we're gonna further assume that if you take the integral between zero and two pi of the absolute value of f squared, then that this function, that this integral is finite, right? So this will be true for, you know, most functions that you find in practice, uh, you know, continuous functions, differential functions. Um, so if your function does this, uh, then, uh, what is true is that one can approximate it uh, uh, using the following uh, infinite sum. So it's going to be uh, this term a zero uh, plus this infinite sum of uh, sines and cosines. Um, each one of these summands is called a Fourier mode. So for each n here, we get a mode of the, uh, of the series. Um, and here, uh, a and b are given by integrals. So a n is given by the integral of f with cosines, and here n is the, the frequency, and b is given by uh, the integral of f with sines, and similarly the frequency is, cont is uh, controlled by n. So he's saying that if you compute these coefficients a and b, and you form this infinite series, then you can approximate your function uh, more and more and more accurately. Uh, so here is an example. Um, so here I have uh, in uh, blue uh, dashed lines, I have uh, an original signal. And then what I've done is I have approximated it using its Fourier series, but using only five modes, right? So I'm only summing the first uh, terms in the series. So just to uh, sort of remember here, each one of these uh, a n cosine and t plus b n sine and t is a mode. So I'm using the series for n equals uh, sort of zero, one, two, three, four, and five. So that's the answer we get here on the left-hand side. And we see that in black, we have the Fourier series and it's um, not a very good approximation. Uh, so in particular, this L to distance is something like 2.7, right? So it's, a, it's not a very good uh, approximation to the original signal. However, if you increase the number of modes, so now you have 50 modes in the original, uh, in the Fourier series, then uh, you will see that the 
uh, again, the Fourier series is in black, approximates much, much better uh, the original series in blue. And we can also see that the L2 distance between the two has decreased um, as well. Um, so again, as we take more and more modes in the Fourier series, then um, the black and uh, blue lines are gonna get in closer and closer and closer. Um, so uh, now we're ready to uh, at least say out loud, what is the strategy we're going to use uh, to try to understand the uh, persistence diagrams of sliding window point clouds for uh, signals f. So the idea is going to be to replace uh, the function f by its uh, truncated Fourier series, right? So uh, it's n of f, where big n is telling you how many modes we're taking in the, in the Fourier series, uh, is gonna be our replacement uh, for f. The reason why we do that is because, um, first of all, we've seen that understanding sliding windows for cosines and sines is actually not that difficult. So it stands to reason that perhaps we have a good chance of understanding it for these types of linear combinations of sines and cosines. That is actually the, the case. Um, and then uh, what, is, what is sort of missing is then trying to figure out how the persistence diagrams look like for the sliding window point clouds of these truncated Fourier series. Um, the idea being that these guys, the series are very, very uh, close to the function for enough modes. Um, and then they get, the point clouds then themselves are going to be similar uh, in the sense that I'm going to describe next. Um, and then if that happens, the hope would be that the persistence diagrams themselves are similar as well. Uh, so again, um, what one would hope is that, the, that one can understand the persistence diagrams of the sliding window point cloud for a function f uh, via the persistence diagrams of the sliding window point cloud for the uh, trigonometric uh, Fourier series. And then uh, the idea would be to try to understand this a little bit better uh, using the fact that sines and cosines seem to play very well with sliding windows. Um, so let's try to understand how is it that these diagrams are getting sort of closer and closer to the diagrams of the original function. So this brings us to the idea of uh, stability of persistence, which I, as I uh, described at the beginning of the uh, lecture, is one of the fundamental results uh, in the application of persistent homology to data science. Uh, and it'll be useful when we try to think about sliding window persistence, sliding windows and persistence. Um, so here's how the uh, story of stability goes. Um, so suppose that you have <clears throat> two data sets. Uh, the blue data set, uh, we're gonna call it Y, and then the uh, black data set X, which is uh, given by these asterisks. So um, one way to think about this is that, you know, X might be sort of the, the real data set, and then Y is the one that we observe, perhaps it is contaminated by noise, measurement noise, perhaps. Um, so I've gone ahead and computed the persistence diagrams in dimensions zero and one for both uh, the point cloud X and the point cloud Y. Um, and hopefully what is apparent is that the number of sort of important features in each uh, dimension is similar for X and Y. That is the idea of stability, the idea that if one wiggles the data set a little bit, meaning going from black to blue, then the persistence diagrams hopefully will also wiggle a little bit, meaning going from uh, black to blue. Uh, let me make that precise. The first uh, ingredient we need is a way of measuring the similarity between these two data sets, X and Y. Okay, so we're gonna do that first. So. Um, suppose that uh, you have your two data sets, X and Y, and they are sitting inside some ambient metric space. Uh, so this can be, for example, Euclidean space, um, as we have, have seen in the, in the case of, for example, sliding window point clouds. Um, we're going to define a quantity called the Hausdorff distance between X and Y. And here's how the definition goes. Um, it is equal to the infimum over all the epsilons so that 
y is contained in the union of balls of radius epsilon around x, where x uh, is the entire sort of x data set, and x itself is also contained in the union of balls of radius epsilon centered at points in the y data set, right? So we need both. So we want the epsilons so that y is containing the epsilon balls around x. We want uh, also the semi epsilon so that x is containing the epsilon balls around y. And we want the infimum, the smallest, smallest, smallest epsilon that makes this possible. Uh, so here's an example. So going back to <clears throat> our data set of asterisks and dots, I've gone ahead and uh, chosen a, a given epsilon, epsilon y, and I've drawn uh, balls of radius epsilon y around the uh, points in the y data set. Uh, and I get the, the, the region in blue. Uh, so as we can see, uh, the region in blue does not cover the data set X. In other words, there are some points, so for example, here, uh, we have this point that is outside the blue region. And similarly, here's another point that is outside the blue region. Uh, we wanna get to the epsilons so that we can uh, sort of cover uh, the X data set using the Y data set. So let me go ahead and increase the size of the balls a little bit. So I've taken a bigger epsilon. Um, so certainly now uh, the blue region covers all of the uh, X data set, um, but perhaps uh, I've gone too far, right? So epsilon is perhaps too big and I, need, I may be able to decrease it a little bit more without losing the covering condition. Um, so notice that even if I reduce uh, the radius a little bit, I still can cover the entire Y data set. Uh, and notice that if I were to reduce it just a little bit more, a tiny smidge more, I would lose the coverage of these asterisks right here, right? So in a way, we think that this is the best we can do for uh, covering X with epsilon balls around Y. Uh, the epsilon that makes this happen is around 0.1425. Uh, so that is sort of the, the, the best epsilon that we can get for covering X with Y. Uh, and similarly, uh, the best epsilon we can get for covering uh, Y with X is uh, near 0 0.2987. So if I were to reduce this epsilon just a little bit more, then I would lose, uh, for example, this blue point here in the boundary and this blue point here in the boundary. Uh, so we have computed the say covering radius needed to cover um, the Y data set with balls um, of certain radius around the X data set. And we've also cover, computed the covering radius for covering the data set uh, with balls around Y. Um, so it turns out that the Hausdorff distance is gonna be the bigger of the two. Uh, why? Because we're looking for the um, smallest epsilon uh, so that I can do both at the same time, cover Y with X and also cover X with Y. So if I were to uh, take uh, epsilon a little bit smaller than this, uh, one of the two data sets will fail the covering condition. So again, uh, we're gonna take the maximum of these two values because uh, we are looking for the epsilons that at the same time cover uh, X with Y and Y with X. So uh, the Hausdorff distance gives you a way to understand similarities between data sets. Uh, it tells you how far apart in a way uh, X is from Y. Like how much do you have to wiggle X to essentially look like Y? Um, let's try to do the same thing, but now for persistence diagrams, let's try to come up with a notion of similarity between persistence diagrams. And here's where the idea of the bottleneck distance comes in. So uh, I'm going to define the bottleneck distance next. Uh, and here's how it works. So suppose that you have two persistence diagrams. 
uh, the asterisks. So here the asterisk only has one feature here, and then the blue dots that have you know, other features as well. Um, the first notion that we're gonna need is that of a matching. Um, so what is a matching? A matching is just going ahead and pairing up asterisks with blue dots, right? So each asterisk is going to uh, be paired with a blue dot. And then anything else that is not paired, we're going to pair it with the diagonal, okay? With a point in the diagonal. Um, the points here in blue here at the bottom are also paired with the diagonal. It's just that the scale doesn't allow us to draw the, the pairings. It doesn't add too much to the picture, but you know everything is paired with something else, whether it be um, an asterisk or a point in the diagonal. So that is a matching. Now, given a matching, we can compute the cost of that matching. So the matching cost is going to be the maximum over the difference between x coordinates and y coordinates over all the pairs that are matched, okay? So for example, I take this point x comma y here is an asterisk, and I take this point x prime comma y prime, which is gonna be a dot, and I'm gonna measure the biggest uh, difference between either the x coordinate or the y coordinate. So uh, that is gonna be the cost of the matching. Uh, and I do that over all the pairs that are matched, and I just look for the worst, right? So for the largest. So in this case, this vertical distance would be the cost of this matching. Um, but of course, there are other possible matchings, right? So for example, we can match these asterisk here at the top left with this other dot. And then for that matching, we also have a cost, which in this case would be just the vertical distance between these two. Um, so now we're ready to define what the bottleneck distance is. Um, the bottleneck distance between two diagrams is equal to the cost of the best matching between the diagrams, right? So we go ahead and look for all the possible matchings between the two diagrams I have. For each matching, I compute its cost, and then I took, and then I take the best cost I can get, right? So the cost of the best matching. Um, so now that we have the Hausdorff distance between point clouds and the bottleneck distance between persistence diagrams, we are ready to uh, state the stability theorem for persistence diagrams. Uh, the stability theorem says the following, <clears throat> is, the, is the following formula. So it says that the bottleneck distance, the, qu the quantity that I have on the left, right? So the bottleneck distance between persistence diagrams, which is again related to the cost of the best matching between these two diagrams is uh, less than or equal to twice the Hausdorff, dif the, the Hausdorff distance between the point clouds, which again is uh, given by the epsilon that I need to sort of enlarge balls around uh, either data set to cover the other, right? So this is the sort of the, the lowest cost that I can get, and this is the best covering radius for both S and Y. So um, this gives you sort of a notion of stability. And it says that, you know, if you contaminate your data X with some noise, and that noise is small as measured by the Hausdorff distance, then the distance between the diagrams will also be small. Uh, so that's why uh, persistence diagrams are said to be stable with respect to Hausdorff noise. So going back to our strategy for understanding the persistence diagrams of the sliding window point cloud of some function, uh, we've seen that it's uh, possible to first approximate your function f by truncated for a series. Uh, and then the more modes you take, meaning the bigger the n, uh, the better the approximation. Um, the reason why we do that is because, um, in fact, understanding the sliding window uh, of trigonometric functions like sines and cosines is actually uh, very, very simple. 
And one can use that knowledge to try to understand the sliding window point clouds of uh, truncated Fourier series. Uh, next, uh, we saw that, you know, or at least I mentioned that with some effort, one can understand the persistence diagrams <clears throat> of the sliding window point clouds for these trigonometric functions. Um, and then the next thing we're going to do, or the, or the next or the third and final step in the in the strategy, is to take the limit as the as in the, of the diagrams as n goes to infinity. So what do I mean by that? I mean that you know as n gets larger and larger and larger, then uh, these uh, truncated Fourier series will start to look more and more and more and more like f. At the same time, as uh, you know this truncated Fourier series starts to look more and more like f, it may, it, it'll happen that the sliding window point cloud will start to look more and more and more like the sliding window point cloud of uh, the original function. Uh, and we've also seen that, and this will happen in the Hausdorff sense, in the sense of Hausdorff, Hausdorff distances. Um, and we've seen that if that happens, then the diagrams themselves, they start to look very, 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 very similar to those for f. So that's, that is the strategy. The strategy is to do everything in the Fourier domain, or at least for truncated Fourier series, uh, and then take limits. Um, this approach was uh, explored in the paper, Sliding Windows and Persistence, an Application of Topology to Signal Analysis. Uh, so if you want to see the details of how this plays out, uh, I recommend uh, checking out the paper. Um, but here are some highlights of the things that you can do by thinking along these lines. So if you start with a function, let's see, let's see some, of, some of the things that one can prove. So if you start with a function f, right, uh, which is ck from zero to pi to r, this means that the function is uh, differentiable. It means that it has, by which I mean that you can take derivatives and you can take k consecutive derivatives. And then the last derivative, the kth, is continuous. So suppose that you have a ck function from zero to pi to r, and that you take a, a subset t of the domain of the function, um, then the following is true. If dgm and dgmn are the persistence diagrams for the uh, original function and for the truncated Fourier series, uh, which we were saying uh, will be similar, then we can actually say how similar they'll be. Uh, it turns out that one can bound the bottleneck distance between the diagrams of F and the diagrams of the truncated Fourier series by this quantity here on the right. So what is this quantity? So here we have, first of all, square root of 4k minus 2. So k is the degree of differentiability of your function f. Uh, here we have the L to norm, which is a way to measure distance between functions. Uh, you, know, you can think of this as the Euclidean distance between vectors, if you want. Um, so it's measuring the distance between the kth derivative of the function f and the truncated Fourier series of the kth derivative of f. And furthermore, it's multiplying this quantity by the square root of d plus 1 divided by n plus 1 uh, to the k minus 1 half. So in particular, if the differentiability of the function, you know, if you can take, let's say, two, two derivatives, right? So if, if f is c2, then you can replace k by 2 here, 2 here, 2 here, and as well uh, 2 here. So what you will see is that as n goes to infinity, in particular, this whole quantity will go to zero, and it'll tell you that the uh, diagrams of the truncated Fourier series will converge to the diagrams of the function in the bottleneck sense. Okay, so th this is sort of the first theorem uh, to justify the strategy that we outlined before of thinking in terms of limits. But um, as we said before, the whole point of this analysis was to try and get some uh, understanding of the choice of uh, parameters um, for the sliding window construction. So uh, that is what the next theorem says. So now suppose that you have a function that is C1, meaning that you have one derivative and that derivative is continuous. Um, and we're also going to assume that the function has period length of two pi over L in the interval between zero and two pi. Um, then if this 
two conditions hold, meaning that the function has been normalized and centered. Uh, these are not essential, but are conditions that just make the statements a little bit easier. Um, then the following is true. Um, the sliding window is non-degenerate uh, for d greater than 2n. So this is saying that we want to choose, so this non-degeneracy is uh, just about self-intersections of this curve, right? So it means that, the, that, that I'm gonna have an honest to God circle, perhaps in a, in a high Euclidean space, uh, if the dimension is bigger than 2a. So notice that this is the, that it is immediately telling you that the dimension of the sliding window embedding is related to n, the number of modes in the um, Fourier series. And then the second observation is that the sliding window point cloud is gonna be as round as possible. So one can, again, mimic an argument as the one presented at the beginning of the lecture for the function just sine of LT. Uh, so one can deduce that the point cloud will be as round as possible when uh, this equation is satisfied. So it, you know, given D here related to the number of modes in the Fourier decomposition, um, and, and if you know sort of how many oscillations your function has in the interval zero to pi that is given by L, the number of periods, uh, then you can find tau, right, in terms of D and L. Mm -hmm. So to complete the picture, uh, here's what we have. So we have the sliding window construction uh, from which we compute persistence diagrams. And what we've found is that uh, we want uh, to take enough harmonics or enough modes to approximate the function f with its uh, truncated Fourier series, that we want d to be at least twice that number of modes, and that if l is the number of periods we're scanning for, then tau uh, should uh, satisfy this uh, equation. So that'll give us a, a, a sort of a cycle that is as round as possible. So as we saw in lecture 16, um, this gives you a method which we call swipers, which is sort of shape agnostic and resistant to dampening when trying to um, compute or uh, quantify recurring patterns. Um, and in the same video, we also described that the field of coefficients, um, you know, uh, is gonna be, you know, Z mod P where P is a prime and we're gonna take it often bigger than the dimension D. Um, the sort of reasoning behind this choice requires, requires a little bit more work, uh, but one can in fact uh, sort of deduce it from the analysis uh, presented here. Um, so the final theorem I'm going to share with you um, describes, you know, why maximum persistence is a reasonable measure of recurrent patterns. So here we go. And so in a similar setting as before, suppose that you have a C1 function, meaning that it has one derivative and the derivative is continuous. And again, suppose that you have a period length of two pi over L, or that the function has L oscillations in the interval zero to two pi. Again, we're gonna center and normalize the function uh, to make the statements uh, a little bit clearer. Um, so as the <clears throat> embedding dimension goes to infinity, right, so as d goes to infinity, but we maintain, we maintain the relation between d and tau, right, that we, we want the window size to be close to the period. Um, so in particular, as d goes to infinity, tau has to go to zero. Um, and if we make our field of coefficients equal to the rationals, and we sample uh, points that are sort of delta dense in here, so the way to think about this is that you are dividing the interval zero to two pi in uh, steps of size delta or less, um, then the following is true. Then the diagram that you get, you know, in the limit, you know, as D reaches infinity and tau goes to zero one ma while maintaining this uh, equation, then the diagram that you get in the end uh, satisfies the following uh, property. Its maximum persistence is gonna be bigger than uh, sort of this two pi, two times the square root of three constant multiplied by the largest Fourier coefficient of the function and then minus twice uh, two times the square root of two delta uh, times the uh, L to norm of the derivative. In other words, uh, this equation tells you that, you know, the more complicated your function F is, meaning that the more complicated the derivative 
is you need to sample more and more points, meaning delta, so that your sliding window point cloud will have a maximum persistence that is bounded below by the largest Fourier coefficient, right? So, so this is why uh, we have this connection between sort of maximum persistence and circularity because that is also controlled by the Fourier coefficients of the function. Um, so um, these type of analysis um, of uh, turning time series data into point clouds and then computing persistence, in fact, opens up the door to computing sort of recurrence of many other data types. Uh, not only sounds and real value signals, but videos and uh, dynamic networks. So what is the sort of general statement? So the general statement is, or the general setup, which I'm gonna call uh, time series analysis or topological time series analysis is the following. Imagine that you have a metric space, MD, right? So it's just a set where you can measure distances between the elements. And we're gonna think of a time series as just a function from some subset of the reals to M, right? So our time series is gonna have values in M. Um, so what are some examples of the, of the set M that we can take, right? So for example, M can be the real numbers. So in that case, we just have functions from some subset of the reals to the reals, um, in which case we just get the sort of one dimensional time series that we've discussed up to this point. Um, M can also be a, a collection of images or a space of images. So in that sense, a time series of images is going to be the same as a video. So we can think of video data as a time series of images. Um, you know, M can be also as a space of functions. So you can analyze the evolution of, let's say, solutions to some system of differential equations, or it can be graphs. So you can think of uh, analyzing time series where, where you're changing is the structure of a graph. Or, you know, you can also think of the space of persistence diagrams, right? So perhaps you can, you know, for each uh, point here in the domain, you, you know, obtain some sort of persistence diagram here in the codomain. So this uh, setup allows you to try to think about uh, sort of recurrent patterns and dynamic patterns in, in, in time series data using ideas from sort of a sliding window persistence. So uh, again, we use the same ideas. We uh, fix a couple of parameters, the dimension <clears throat> and the delay, and we again compute these vectors of um, evaluations of the time series. The difference now is that the vectors that we get are not gonna live in Euclidean space, but rather in these sort of Cartesian product of um, elements in the sort of more general metric space. Um, in other words, if M is a space of images, then uh, each entry of this vector is gonna be an image frame, right? So this is gonna be a sort of a vector of uh, arrays. Uh, if this is a space of graphs, then each entry here is gonna be a graph. Uh, and we're gonna be able to compute distances between these vectors. So uh, what we get from here is we get the, as, we, uh, as before, we get the sliding window point cloud. Um, and the whole point is to compute uh, sort of topological summaries of such point clouds. Um, uh, we've already applied this successfully to one dimensional signals as I uh, described before, right? So periodic signals give you cycles and then those cycles can be detected using persistence diagrams. But we can also look at uh, video data, as I just described, where this is a time series where at each point, at each time point, we are observing an image frame, right? So by taking vectors, sliding window vectors of image frames, we can also analyze, um, you know, a, the persistence diagrams and then the maximum persistence. So for example, here, I'm showing a picture where I'm plotting the maximum persistence, meaning the periodicity score versus the window size. And then the um, vertical lines are actually the predicted optimal window sizes from the theory of one dimensional time series. So uh, from the beginning of the lecture, I described you know, how window size and period of the signal um, are sort of 
uh, paired so that one can maximize maximum persistence. And, and, you know, lo and behold, sort of the maximum persistence picks exactly at the points predicted by the theory of how to choose the parameters. Um, another type of recurrence we, we saw uh, last time was this idea of quasi-periodicity. Um, so we have the periodicity occurs when they have sort of different frequency, different modes of frequency, which are uh, overlapped, but uh, they differ via rational numbers. So these are called commensurate. And then quasi-periodicity appears when you have superposition of uh, different frequency modes, um, which are non-commensurate, meaning that they are not related via rational numbers. Uh, for periodicity, of course, we have uh, circular sliding window point clouds with the appropriate parameters. And then for quasi-periodicity, uh, we have uh, toroidal sliding window embeddings, uh, which can be uh, quantified, for example, using, again, uh, persistence diagrams. Um, so here is the, the next theoretical question I want to um, go over in this last part of the lecture. Um, so one question to ask is, why uh, is the sliding window point cloud of a quasi-periodic function expected to be sort of a hypertorus, meaning a, a torus of higher and higher dimension? And what is the dimension that one expects? So here is one way to analyze this type of uh, dynamics or this type of uh, time series. Um, so the setup is as follows. Imagine now that you have your time series F with values in the complex numbers and that the time series takes the form uh, F of T equal to summation of CN times E to the I omega and T uh, where uh, the C's are just complex numbers, the coefficients that you have here in the summation, and the omegas are just the frequencies, positive frequencies that we're gonna have here. And I is, you know, the same, you know, square root of minus one, the, the, the imaginary number. Uh, and we're gonna further uh, require that the numbers one, omega zero, omega one, and all the way up to omega n are linearly independent over the rationals. Uh, so, in other words, uh, F is a superposition of you know, frequencies whose, of, 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 sort of, of modes whose frequencies are uh, not related via rational numbers. So this is a quasi-periodic function, a, a family, in fact, of quasi-periodic functions. So let's see how the, the sliding window persistence of this family looks like. So uh, if this is the function, then we can compute uh, you know, it's sliding window as we did before, you know, just evaluating at each uh, entry. So you will notice with a little bit of algebra that uh, this in fact can be written uh, in the following fashion. Um, so one can pull out uh, the coefficient CN multiplied by uh, these modes. And again, T is a variable. And then we have these constant vectors because tau is constant. D is constant as well, and the omegas are constant as well. Um, and then if you use matrix multiplication notation, uh, you will realize that the sliding window uh, of F, for at least for this type of quasi-periodic function, can be written as a matrix of exponential terms times these uh, vector, uh, where each entry in the vector is sort of a uh, a mode of vibration. Um, so uh, the, the conclusion is that at least for this family of quasi-periodic functions, one can write the sliding window uh, embedding of F as a matrix. It turns out to be a van der Mond matrix. Uh, that's just uh, a family of matrices that are very well studied. And it's gonna be times this other vector of exponentials. Um, so if you, if you look closely, this first entry here uh, of this vector looks like sort of something like cosine of omega zero t sine omega zero t. Like if you think of how this complex number breaks into its real and complex, into its real and imaginary part. So this is in fact a point, the first coordinate gives you a point in a circle of radius, the length of z zero, right? So the first coordinate is essentially traversing a circle. The second coordinate is traversing another circle. And all the coordinates are tra traversing different circles. In other words, this is traversing 
the product of n plus one circles, which is the same as a torus of dimension n plus one, right? Um, and there is this beautiful, beautiful theorem by Kronecker that studies these types of vectors very, very, very well. So here's the theorem. The theorem says that if, if we denote by S1C, the circle in the complex plane whose radius is the length of C, and we let uh, X uh, F of T be the curve or the, yeah, the curve from the n plus one torus given by this expression is the same expression we had before here on the right hand side, it's the same expression we have here. So if you take that curve and the, and the numbers one omega zero through omega n are linearly independent over Q, uh, so if these frequencies are linearly independent, then uh, the, the point cloud that you get by evaluating this curve on uh, integers is dense on the n plus one torus given by the product of these circles, right? So dense here means that it covers the entire n plus one torus, uh, you know, everywhere, right? There are no uh, regions where you don't have points of this fashion. That's what Kronecker proves. Um, so to summarize, um, the sliding window point cloud can be written as this product of a matrix, a van der Mond matrix, times this curve that when you evaluate it on integers gives you a dense subset of the torus, right? Um, so in particular, if this matrix uh, has full rank, meaning that it doesn't, it doesn't uh, have a kernel, then it'll keep the, the torus, uh, perhaps it'll distort it a little bit, but the shape of the torus will be maintained. And that's why the sliding window point cloud would also look like a torus. So to summarize, uh, if the delay is between zero and two pi, and you, you know, times the, the, the maximum frequency, then uh, this van der Mond matrix will be full rank, right? So that's the condition we need to keep the torus that sort of uh, this XF describes. Uh, moreover, if the dimension of the embedding is bigger than the number of modes, so this again looks exactly like the analysis we did for periodic uh, signals, um, then the sliding window point cloud is going to be dense in an n plus one torus. So notice that the number of frequencies is controlling the dimension of the torus that, that, that we get in the end. So here's a picture of everything we've said in this quasi-periodicity analysis. Um, so if you have a function that is quasi-periodic, meaning the superposition of frequencies, of, of sort of oscillating modes, so that the frequencies are uh, sort of incommensurate, then the sliding window point clouds look like uh, high dimensional tori, the dimension of the torus is uh, controlled by the number of frequencies and the persistence diagrams can be used to detect uh, the toroidality of um, the sliding window point clouds. Um, so as an application, um, we saw last time that one can look at these videos of uh, interesting uh, dynamical systems on, 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 on vocal folds. Um, so here's uh, the system of clinical asymmetry uh, and you have that this vocal fold on the left and this vocal fold on the right are vibrating at different frequencies. So it turns out that when you do the sliding window uh, embedding of these time series, again, I'm thinking of each uh, image frame as a time point. Uh, so we take a, a sliding window vector of all the images, then it turns out that it gives us something with uh, toroidal uh, persistence, right? So you have uh, two classes in dimension one in red, and then one class persisting in dimension two in green. So we've shown that uh, at least for um, real valued time series and video uh, time series, um, that one can use uh, persistence successfully to recover uh, recurrence like, uh, recurrent patterns like periodicity and quasi-periodicity.
So to summarize, in this lecture, we've talked about the theory um, underlying the analysis of time series data using topological ideas, um, being that, um, you know, starting with time series data, one can turn it into point clouds using sliding windows, and then one can compute persistence. Um, and then the idea to understand this pipeline is to approximate the time series via truncated Fourier series. Um, and we see that that is possible because we have this idea of stability of, of persistence diagrams, um, which on the one hand tells us that the diagrams corresponding to point clouds that are very closely, um, that are very close, will also produce diagrams that are very close, but it can also be used in this type of analysis that require taking limits. Uh, so that is it for today. Uh, thank you very much. We'll see you next lecture.